I'm not going to explain too much of this syntax. Here's examples of the syntax. Copy it and uh, use it. And read the help functions and figure out why I wrote them this way. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to do something called calc geno prob. And what this is going to do is it's going to add some extra information to the BXR object. To me, I found this syntax a little disturbing at first. I'm replacing my BXR object with the output of calc genoprob. But the output is a whole cross object, so it works. I'm actually going to calculate the probabilities of all the genotypes in one centimorgan steps across the genome. I'm going to use this CF map function with this error rate um, details. I'm also going to do something called sim.geno. I need these things later. So I'm just going to run them. And on Sue's machine, they take a minute. On your machine, they may take a few minutes. Um, so patience with these, and this patience will pay off. Especially the sim.geno. There, they're done. Uh, now I'm set to go. Oh, I'm not quite set. I've learned from past experience that I really want to have sex as a variable, a numeric variable, and sex is stored as a factor. So I'm going to pull it out and make it into a numeric and just keep it around my environment. And um, there I made it, and here I'm going to check, and oops, sure enough, there it is. I could even type sex, and I could see that, oh, it's a numeric variable, ones and twos. That's great. Now I'm going to do a genome scan. I'm, I'm all set up. I'm going to call my scan bxr.scan1a. Now, dot is a pretty common convention in R. People use it to just act as a separator between long variable names. And I like to do this. If I'm having multiple crosses in my environment, it's especially handy. Maybe not so important here, but it's a habit. And you should get into some habits. And they can be your own. You can have your own style. Uh, but your naming conventions are important because they help you keep track of what you're doing. You lose track of what you're doing, yeah, you're going to be in trouble. So I know that if I'm doing a scan on BXR, I'm going to call it BXR.scan something. And this is my first scan, so I'm going to call it 1A. And I'm going to do it, and it should be pretty quick. While it's running, I'm going to tell you that I'm scanning the, the cholesterol trait, and I'm using sex as a covariate. I'm going to use the HK method. It's a fast method. It's fine. And um, then I'm going to look and I'm going to see, oh, red. That's not good. But what, I'll, what I'm going to learn, if you can read this stuff, is that it, it's just complaining to me about some missing data. I knew they were missing data. Um, so I think I'm OK with that. Now, here are some additional lines of code that are commented out. And I commented these out because this is my permutation test. And you'll see this comment says, may take a long time. And I'm not kidding, it may take a long time. But I did this, and I ran a permutation test. And I want to point out that I used 100 permutations, and I did this perm.xsp equals true. So that gives us a special treatment of the X chromosome, which is something I'll discuss in the near future. Then I saved those results. And now, because I've saved them, I don't have to run it again. I can just load it from my environment. Um, it's, it's a file that's in my directory, and I just loaded it. This is a good scripting trick. When you run an, an intense computation that takes a long time, run it once, save it, comment out all that code so you know exactly what you did, and then load it so that when you go back, and you will go back over and over through your script and have to do it again, that it's always, it's always there for you. You don't have to run it again unless you change something that will alter it. Um, having done a genome scan, I think I'd like to plot it. And I can uh, just plot a genome scan by calling the plot function. And you probably notice something striking about the genome scan for cholesterol. I actually like the aspect ratio of, uh, of these things to be a little different. That's why I like quartz. It, it does that for me rather smoothly. Um, 
and there's something missing from this plot and these are the the horizontal lines that tell me um, how important things are the red line is a 0.05 significance and the green line is the low ball 0 0.63 I can explain that if you are interested. It's a good question to ask, but think e to the minus 1. And um, there are my red lines and my green lines. And I want you to notice that for the X chromosome, they're different. It's because I did X special. X is special. There you go. But there's nothing going on on the X chromosome today. The action really seems to be around chromosome 17. And if I look a little harder, there's something on chromosome 7. And if we're really mucking through the mud, maybe 1, 4, 5, 10, 12, I would say that cholesterol is genetically complex. But it also has a really strong signal on chromosome 17. Uh, I think over the next few weeks, we're going to figure out what's on chromosome 17. I, I think that's our job. That's, I'm going to make it my job. We'll find out what's there. Uh, actually, I don't even know, so in case you think I'm playing games, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, there's some other ways to summarize the results of a scan. The summary function, remember I told you, all right, let's look at my environment. And I want you to notice there's a new couple new things. The perm permutations are in my environment and the scans are in my environment. And because I used my naming conventions, I know what these are and I know that this permutation goes with that scan. Um, and if I want to know what an object in R is, the first thing I want to try is summary. So if I try summary, I get this kind of longish report. These cryptic things over here, RS, that's the name of a genetic marker. It's a SNP reference number. Um, that's genetic marker. This is actually an anonymous location, so when I calculated my genoprobs, I went through the genome and one centimorgan steps, and some of those steps happen to be very close to markers and some of them not, and here's one that was probably in between some markers, and so it just has a name, and it's going to tell me actually on which chromosome and which position what the LOD score is, and if I just do summary with no options, it tells me for every chromosome what the position is of the highest LOD score peak. And if we scroll down, you'll see that on chromosome 17 at 13.41 centimorgans, probably too many significant digits there, but there it is. There's a LOD score of about 16. That's a pretty respectable LOD score. I like that. Um, but I can actually make the report a little tidier. Um, by uh, giving it some options and I'm going to tell it to use the permutation results to find a 10% a significance cutoff and if I use that I really find chromosome 17 comes up 7 and 12 are the other um, the other things that come up here as being uh, interesting and I, I misplaced my plot the good thing about having a script is if you misplace something, you can just make it again. And oh yeah, 17, 7, and 12. And you notice that 12 doesn't quite make the 5% line, but I, I wanted to allow myself to get things that were almost at the 5% level, uh, which is why I used alpha 0.1 in my report. I can also get a confidence interval. I'd, often don't want to know just the peak. I want to know um, around the peak where things are. So for example on chromosome 17 the peak position is 13.4 but the limits of my 95 percent confidence interval are 14.6 to 15.9. That's going to be very useful information for us later on when we try to find what genes might be responsible for this QTL. And actually, I can just get the confidence interval directly by using this function. And it, this function, lawdint, gives me a little more information. And it actually gives me the names of the SNPs that are at the boundaries of the confidence interval. And those are even handier, because 
SNPs in the genome are annotated and I know exactly where they are. I can find them using informatics resources and we'll show you. Uh, there's one other thing I want to know about this and I know there's a QTL on chromosome 17 but I don't know whether the B6 allele is high or the BTBR allele is high or what's going on. So I'm going to do an effect plot and I'm going to do an effect plot of the cholesterol variable and here's a little funky syntax. You have to tell it to look for a marker name and you can find the marker name in the BX our data set that's nearest to chromosome 17, 14.31 centimorgans. And actually, here's a neat trick. Often you don't write in R command just wholly incarnate. You, you write pieces of it and then you build it up and make more and more complex expressions until your code becomes impenetrable. Um, but you can actually dissect a piece of code by just looking at the executing the pieces. So find.marker, all it does is give me back the name of that marker that's nearest to that position. Um, here we go. Let's look at the effect plot. Whoa. Um, first thing I want to notice here is this y-axis looks kind of funny. 0, negative 2, those don't look like cholesterol levels to me. Actually, oh yes, I forgot. I rank Z transform them. So these are normal scores. They're not quantitative cholesterol levels. They're just indicators of high and low. Now I notice at this SNP the BB, BR, and RR genotypes. Remember in the very beginning I, I told RQTL what my allele names were. That's what made this plot know how to put those symbols there, but that's a minor point. What I really think is cool here is that this is a recessive locus. If you have, oh, or it could be a dominant locus, depends how you want to call it. Let's call it dominant. So it's dominant B. If you have at least one B allele, high cholesterol. Both R alleles, low cholesterol. And um, now I know something. Actually, why not just look at all three? So I'm just going to fire these off all at once. And I want you to notice I added something here. PAR, this is a way to interact with standard R graphics. Does not work with ggplot. All of the RQTL graphics are standard graphics. And this is telling me to arrange my plots in one row with three columns. And you'll see what the effect of that is. And I'm going to change the aspect ratio a little bit and you'll see that my my labels are not all that clear. Um, if I were um, doing this again I might make more informative labels because I don't immediately know what that cryptic thing is but if I go back to my code I know that the first plot is chromosome 7 the second plot is chromosome 12 and the third plot is chromosome 17 now unlike ggplot, I had to be very careful to make sure that all the y-axes on these plots are the same. If I didn't make the y-axis plot, the y-axis the same on all the plots, it would be difficult to compare one to the other. But here they're all the same, so they are directly comparable. And you can see that uh, the chromosome 7 QTL is actually the other way around. This is an R dominant. R is the high allele. It's a B recessive. B is the low allele. This middle one is additive. Isn't this nice? I didn't even, this is just the trait I picked. So I got, you know, one, one recessive B, one additive trait where the heterozygote is kind of in the middle, and then I got a dominant B where it goes the other way around. So this is the chromosome 7 story, this is the chromosome 12 story, and this is the chromosome 17 story. I think that that is as far as I want you all to go in your assignment, but I know how ambitious you all are. Um, so let me recap what I did. I opened up the data set, I looked at it for a little while, I shortened up the variable names, I made a bunch of plots, I got a feel for the data, some correlations, some scatter plots, 
Then I set myself up to do some genome scans. I did a genome scan. Notice that I use sex as an additive covariate. If you have sex in your data set, always do that. Always do that. Can I say that again? Always use sex as an additive covariate if it's in your data set. I did my genome scans. I drew a genome scan plot. I did a little bit of a summary. I did some effect plots. And now I know something about the genetics of cholesterol in these mice.